next speaker, I am very proud to begin this conference with a very famous Torontoan, I think it's called. Don, how do you say it? Torontonian. Oh, my God. Don Tapscott. Don. Uh, thank you very much for that too kind introduction. This is great. I'm really looking forward to uh, the next few days. And I am delighted uh, actually uh, to do this, amongst other things. It's a rare uh, thing for me to actually get to give a talk in, in Canada. And as the first speaker, I would like to um, congratulate uh, Richard and uh, Moses for organizing TED City. And I'd also like to thank them for, for uh, having Canadian content. Uh, when Richard first told me that was his plan, I said, it's never going to fly. And uh, I'm very uh, pleased to have been uh, proven wrong on that particular issue. Where's the beeper? So uh, let's get into it. New medium of human communications, new economy, how does the internet change business? Well, I get asked this uh, all the time, and people want to know how to create a great web strategy. You get questions like, how do I build a fabulous website that gets lots of eyeballs and is really sticky and becomes a big portal and is really beautiful and more beautiful than my competitor's website? I need a web strategy. The last thing in the world any company needs is a web strategy. You need a business strategy enabled by the web. The last thing in the world you need is a great website. What you need is a great business web. And that's a new model of how various entities can come together on the internet to create value in new ways. And uh, as for eyeballs, I've been telling people you got the wrong body part. <laughs> it's, it's about building relationship capital. It's hearts account, not eyeballs. And you can see this reflected in the whole way that we think about dot-coms and the way that we think about the economy. I mean, stick a dot-com at, <laughs> at, the, at the end of your business, right? <laughs> and then go get 50 million in venture funding and run the flag up the pole and, uh, and try and see who salutes. Uh, I think we view the economy wrong, this new economy. New economy is technology. The old economy is everything else, right? The new economy is NASDAQ. The old economy is everything else. Well, to me, this is a wrong way of viewing things. <laughs> He'll be the last person to do that <laughs> uh, in the conference. Um, the new economy are those companies building new business models enabled by the internet. And the old economy are those companies that have not done that. And you can have technology companies in both, just like you can have mining companies and car companies and, and banks and so on in both. Business model innovation at the heart of creating a new economy. We're convinced in the research that we've been doing that the key to competing in this new environment is, uh, is not a quality or agility or re-engineering or sound management or innovative marketing or all the rest of that that people talk about. The key to competing in this new environment is business model innovation in the sense that there are fundamentally new models of the firm that are emerging. And industry by industry, sector by sector, these new models are obliterating the old models. Why is this happening? Well, we have this new communications medium. It's becoming ubiquitous. There'll be a billion people on the net in the year 2003 we'll see some big surprises in terms of what countries leapfrog over other countries. All of you use the net on a daily basis. You've self-selected to come to this conference. But if I'm talking to a senior uh, executive audience around the world, I say, who's been on the web in the last couple of days? You know, CEOs, presidents, uh, EVPs kind of thing. You typically get about half the hands in, in the US, but about the same in Canada. Scandinavia, maybe a little more. The UK, 20%. France and Belgium, 10%. Malaysia, two-thirds. Singapore, three-quarters. Japan and Korea, nobody. Managers in some cultures don't use the internet. And this is a big problem because personal use is the precondition for any kind of comprehension. You have no hope of understanding what this thing is unless you use it personally with your own fingers. 
secretary's fingers don't count. You know, it's got to be your fingers. So uh, we'll see some big surprises in terms of what cultures leapfrog over others. Now the net's growing in a second way. It's growing in bandwidth. If what we have is pots, 64 kilobits per second, plain old telephone. If that's a three foot wide garden path, where we're going to shortly, I was with a company called Windstar uh, several months ago. They're delivering OC3 to the desktop. OC3 is wider than three feet. It's a mile wide, to use this information highway analogy. And that doesn't tell the whole story, because this highway a mile wide is digital, and you can stack cars up going down the highway. So for the first time in history, we have the ability to interconnect human intellect and human brains. We also have the ability to interconnect all of these inert, I'm typically covered in these things, <laughs> these inert uh, things that are becoming smart communication, <coughs> Uh, communicating devices, and, and they're, they're full of knowledge. My hotel room a couple of nights ago, the, the door had knowledge. It has a chip in it, it's inner network. Um, I had a camera stolen from a hotel room in Miami, and the door knew about me. It knew who'd, who'd been in and out of the room, and we actually found an unauthorized um, access. My cell phone is a web browser. I, I can surf the web, I can get my top 25 stocks. If any of you'd like to come up and look at the stocks, I'm I'm tracking afterwards. Dude, I just reprogrammed my car key last week. My, my house key here is a chip in it. My Palm Pilot. If you want to change a business card, come on up and we'll do that Palm thing. First time I ever did that, I felt a little uncomfortable. It was like, do I know you well enough? But uh, um, so we have all these uh, ubiquitous information. There will be trillions of internet appliances sometime this decade. So we're starting to internetwork human knowledge. But there's another thing that's happening and that's very important. The net's growing in another way. It's growing in functionality. Let me explain. And you're a sophisticated audience, and I'm the first speaker, so I'm gonna really push you <laughs> on this. Why do we have the firm? That question was posed by an economist named Ronald Coase 60 years ago. He won a Nobel Prize for his paper, Theory of the Firm. He says, the open market's the best mechanism to determine the allocation of goods and resources. Why doesn't everybody do their own thing? Why isn't every independent contractor an, an independent agent all the way along, uh, along the way? Why doesn't a chemist come up with a great idea and sell it to product planners who'd sell it to, you know, hold a little auction and sell it to some engineers and so on? He says, the answer is transaction costs the cost of negotiating and collaborating and execu executing transactions and, and handling payments and so on. So we organize in our, ourselves into these things called the firm because the transaction costs within the boundaries of the firm are lower than they are out there in an open market. And it was a good theory. Henry Ford owned a power plant and a shipping company and a glass factory. He owned a mahogany force in Honduras to get the wood for his cars because he, he judged that the costs of communicating and executing transactions within this firm, bringing all that into the boundaries of the firm, were lower than they were of doing it out in the open market. Good theory. Now, what, what's been going on is in the last um, decade, we've seen the growth of networking. So the boundaries of this firm are becoming, uh, are becoming more, more porous. I call it uh, extended enterprise and, and paradigm shift, but it's been called uh, outsourcing, virtual corporation, clusters, swarms, the Kiritsu, and so on. Has everyone tried to f figure out what's happening to the firm? W where this is going is to its logical conclusion, I, I think at least for this economy. We call it the business web. And the reason is that out there, for the first time ever in history, we have this deep, rich, publicly available infrastructure, which is rich in function. It's got all that stuff that Ronald Coase was talking about, transaction engines and payment systems and micropayment systems and negotiation tools and auction tools and so on are part of this deep, rich infrastructure. So this enables us to, to rethink the firm. Now, the firm is not going away, but the basic business models are. And we've been studying a couple of hundred of these over the last uh, two years. We call it the business web or B-web. And you can organize these things according to the degree to which this is centrally orchestrated and the degree to which value is high or low integrated in this thing. So something that has 
is self-organizing, low integration and value. This is what we call the Agora. Who here has been to uh, eBay and bought or, bought or sold something on eBay? Okay. Homework assignment uh, number two is uh, go to eBay. There's something in your garage or basement or attic that somebody wants, wants to buy and you'd like to get rid of. When you go there, you'll join 4.2 million other auctions currently underway. This is the Greek Agora gone global, real time, 365 days a year. This particular type of Agora is something that we call the open market. I'll do a little uh, self-criticism <laughs> here. It was uh, four years ago we discovered eBay. They had revenues of a couple of million. We wrote a report for our members who said, this is going to be big. It's going to change the world. Price discovery mechanisms. You know, we'll have real-time dynamic pricing. And while I was feeling very proud about this report, a fellow Canadian went and invested in eBay, $70,000. And today his investment is worth over four billion U.S. dollars. But I wrote a great report. <laughs> Duh. Um, okay, so eBay is, is an open market. It's one type of agro. But there are all kinds of others that are starting to appear. So we've got these things like B2B exchanges, where the entire auto industry is getting together. And yesterday it was announced IBM, Nortel, and a bunch of companies getting together to create an exchange in that industry. We have buy-side auctions, where buyers bid on stuff. We got sell-side auctions, where, um, um, where the sellers actually participate. And you can see the price changing on the screen. Now, if you've got low integration of value and hierarchical control, this is what we call the aggregation. Now, E-Trade is an aggregation. It, it takes the value proposition of a broker. A broker gives you access to the market, and you can execute trades, and they give you advice and knowledge and so on. And they disaggregate that into all of its elements. They bring it back together on the net. They brand it. And if you go on to E-Trade and, and compare the stock price of, uh, of Selectron and Celestica over the last year, there's a little third-party company that's doing the graphing uh, for you. It looks like E-Trade is doing, but it's actually part of the business web. These things have taken over a third of the retail stock market. It'll be two-thirds in two years, an entire industry wiped out by a new business model. And there are all kinds of other aggregations that are starting to appear. We've got Grocery Gateway in Canada, P Peapod, Webvan, and so on. Now, if there's high integration of value, and it's centrally orchestrated, this is what we call the value chain. And uh, Cisco is a value chain. It's based on the internet. Cisco is a manufacturing company that doesn't make things. Their business web makes their products. The final assembly of that uh, Cisco router in their plant is a small piece of the overall value creation. Uh, Cisco doesn't design its products. Its business web does. It doesn't manufacture, or it doesn't support and service its, its products. Its business web does. Now, Cisco is now the most valuable corporation on planet Earth. It took away a big chunk of what Lucent. Lucent ought to have that revenue. Lucent had Bell Labs for Pete's sake, you know, the biggest store of, 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 of mines in this industry ever. They invented the transistor. But a new business model was able to set them aside. Now, Lucent's adopted this model now, and Nortel did it some time ago. Nortel's doing great uh, as a result. So in every industry, it doesn't matter what industry you're in, the next step is that industry is about to go through a big restructuring. Where well, right now, you're a buyer, right? And you deal with all these large suppliers, and you hook up with EDI, and the interfaces are all very, very clumsy, and, and it takes a lot of time to, to build them, so you don't even have medium and small suppliers online. And where this is going is that rather than hooking up with directly, you'll hook up with an industry exchange, like the one announced by IBM and Nortel um, uh, yesterday. And this exchange will have all kinds of new price discovery mechanisms, like auctions and so on. It's going to have collaboration tools. And it, it's transforming the structure of every industry. Now, the next type, this is magic, the self-organizing alliance. You've got tight integration of value, but nobody's running the thing. So Linux would be a great example of that. Linux is an operating system developed by thousands of programmers. They've never met. They all work for different companies. And they do it on a volunteer basis. We've been calling them digital Rotarians. And this thing has a third of the server market. It took away a third of Microsoft's strategic product overnight. Now, it's called open source. 
If you could develop an operating system this way, what else could you build? Well, Lego built this thing called the Mindstorm. And it found all these kids, because kids know more about adults, <laughs> about the biggest innovation changing the world today. Uh, all these kids started hacking the code. So Lego, rather than suing them, they opened up the codes. Um, and all these thousands and thousands of kids are now developing applications for Mindstorm. They've harnessed the genius of their customers in creating their own products. So it's a huge success. What else could you build? I was in a meeting two weeks ago in, in San Francisco. It's called the Open Source School Book. A bunch of teachers, educators getting together. They want to create all texts, K to 12, on a volunteer basis. So the grade nine history text will be developed by historians and and uh, educational psychologists and teachers and edu parents, probably kids. And it probably won't have Mikhail Gorbachev being the president of the Soviet Union, like my son's history text does. Yeah, so his school is going to adopt it. It'll wipe out the entire textbook industry if this happens. And it'll raise huge questions about who gets to control the curriculum. You know, what will the grade nine biology text say about Darwin, that he's just a theory? What else could you build? Let's really push this. Could you create a new generation jumbo jet without an aircraft company? You could create a third of one. A third of a Boeing 777 is software. So if you could create Linux, you could create the software. How about the design? Well, these things are all designed in cyberspace. There's no models, wind tunnels, or blueprints anymore. The first model of a Boeing 777 was full size, and it flew with people in it. It was a Boeing 777. And as for the manufacturing, well, you, you would need a place, of course. but. This executive at Boeing, he says to me, well, Don, we really view a 777 as being a whole bunch of parts flying together in close formation. <laughs> and, uh, I'm about to get on one of those suckers in a couple of days, too. And they fly together really well. Um, uh, if you've been, well, of course you need a place, but maybe the final assembly would be a relatively small piece of the overall value creation. So the point there, could your customers come in with, a, with an Alliance B-Web and wipe, up, wipe out your markets? Could they create a television studio or network, Moses? Or on the other hand, how do you harness the energy of your customers and, the, and their brilliance in actually building your products? This is a time of vast new opportunity for those companies that can figure it out. Now, the final type is what we call the distributive network. And in the old economy, we had these things. There, was the, there were the roads and the, the old um, pow, uh, power companies, Ontario Hydro and the telcos and so on. Well, now what's happening is all of these are becoming based on the internet. So this, all this new amazing functionality that's starting to happen. This is a Toronto-based uh, company, which uh, full disclosure here, I've, uh, I've been incubating. So I think it's uh, got a great uh, future. But this is the new generation of location-based services, where you say, you know, I want to go to 10 places. Uh, um, um, uh, find me the best route, take into account traffic conditions, and find me a Sony Trinitron TV 27 inches uh, within 15 minutes of the route, and, and um, I want to go to Bregman's, uh, or to, uh, se sorry, Second Cup sometime in the afternoon, and um, if there's one of my friends, um, the top 30 list uh, within the area, uh, I'll connect them, see if we can get together, and um, that's just one of thousands of new, it's called location-based services. All of you have a location at all point in times. And if that location can be known to you and appropriately within privacy constraints to others, a whole new world of, of applications opens up. Now, um, there are all kinds of other distributive networks. Walter Riston, remember the former chairman of Citibank, says, who's going to create the financial services supermarket? Will it be something called a bank? He says, I doubt it. He liked uh, GE, massive uh, cash flow. I was in Brazil about a month ago. This guy gave me this restaurant money. 5,000 restaurants are creating their own currency. And they're about to put it on the internet. The government apparently is very interested in, in all of that. But um, so, well, look who might be able to do it. A little Toronto-based company called 724 Solutions. All of the stuff that runs on this is actually built by 724 Solutions, and I can go on there and I get full access to, to all my finance. I can pay my bills. It goes like pay, pay, dispute, pay, and you can you know pay pay a dozen bills in in, in a couple of minutes. So um, another a good Canadian example: Descartes Systems in this new logistics industry, because 
We've got to move stuff around, just like we still have a need to eat and be clothed and mobile and, and fed and so on. Well, these guys are, 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 are doing great. Uh, um, as, a, as a company that's providing the infrastructure, their distributive network for being able to do all this. Or you mentioned Enron. Do you know about Enron? <laughs> you mentioned them, as, as I did about six weeks ago, to a bunch of executives in the power industry. You get this look of fear and anxiety come across their face. They started out distributing gas, then electrical power, then bandwidth, information. They just distribute stuff. And it's all based on the internet. In one week, they'll They'll enter into two markets, and they'll, uh, they'll buy a company, get rid of a company, and build a couple of partnerships. Uh, we, we called them, in the new book, we called them the Mohammed Ali of distributive networks. They float like a butterfly and sting like a bee. This is now a multi-billion dollar company, and it's wreaking havoc throughout an entire industry. <laughs> so to close, um, these are new business models. And they're about as different from the old industrial corporation of Henry Ford as it was from the, uh, the, the feudal craft shop of the penultimate agrarian economy. And the implications for business strategy are huge. Rather than doing the big five-year plan, just come up with a great value proposition, something that would delight customers. Don't think about whether or not you could do it, because the art of the possible is transformed because of, of the business web. And then you disaggregate that into its elements. You bring together all the partners to deliver that. You create value for customers, wealth for shareholders. And as an aside, it appears you obliterate your competition if you care about things like that, and many companies do. So um, this is the new environment. This is not outsourcing, by the way. There's nothing in the outsource. You don't start with the old corporation and figure what ought to go out. You start with the customer value proposition. Figure what's the business web to deliver that. So to close, uh, this is a, if I may use the term, paradigm shift. You get one of these, you get a crisis of leadership. Vested interests fight against change. Leaders of old paradigms are often the last to embrace the new. The Swiss had 90% of the watch industry. They wouldn't put wa uh, quartz in a watch because they knew that watches had the Swiss movement. And they lost the industry for two decades. The leaders of Newtonian physics fought against Einstein's general theory of relativity. Galileo had a rough life trying to convince the church that the Earth wasn't at the center of the universe. He was only exonerated four years ago by the Pope. <laughs> you know. Who are the computer companies today having a terrible time? Most of the leaders of the old paradigm in computing are gone. So how is your company going to find leadership? And how will Canada find leadership for this transformation? Well, my bottom line is that we studied thousands of organizations. Leadership can come from anywhere. Chairman, CEO, CIO, business unit manager. We documented a story of a secretary who was a key person in the transformation of a division of Citibank Canada. And she had what it took to be a leader. She willed it. And that's kind of an upbeat um, message to leave, that leadership is each of our personal opportunity. This statistically is true that anyone from anywhere can be a leader. So maybe it's your opportunity. I, I think most companies are at a turning point. We've got door number one, door number two. And door number one is the status quo. And for those that take that route, the future will surely be a bleak one. Uh, there's another route that uh, you can take, and I certainly look forward to discussing it with you over the next uh, few days. Uh, a French uh, philosopher um, and uh, author, novelist named Victor Hugo says there's nothing so powerful as an idea whose time has come. Well, I guess the time came for Ted City, Canada, but the, more broadly, the time has come for a new medium of human communications to fundamentally transform the nature of wealth creation, the nature of social development, and arguably even the nature of governance it, it itself. And um, hopefully the time has come for each of you to find that uh, leader within you to change your company, and in doing so, uh, this country. Uh, for one, one thing for sure is the, uh, the next period will not be boring, so thank you very much.